we're going to get started. Good morning, everybody. Well done for making it here uh, on the last day of KubeCon. You're probably a bit tired, but hopefully we can wake you up with some spicy platform engineering and financial institution questions. So I'm going to do a really quick introduction, a very quick level setting, and then I'll introduce our panelists. So we're talking about platform engineering within financial institutions. So what is platform engineering? This is a quick definition of what a platform is from the CNCF platforms white paper. So a platform is just an integrated collection of capabilities defined and presented according to the needs of the platform users. Straightforward enough. According to the white paper, for companies who are investing in platforms, they can accelerate product development and delivery, improve reliability and resilience, reduce risk of security and regulatory issues, which is an interesting one for this group, and reduce costs and improve developer experience. And according to Gartner, by 2026, which is not far away, 80% of large software engineering organizations will establish platform engineering teams. So to summarize those three slides, platforms are good, everyone should have one. But is that really the case? And also, is that really the case when you're in an industry that faces heavy regulations such as the financial industry? So I'm delighted to introduce our amazing panel who are here to answer some of these questions. So I'll introduce myself first, why not? Uh, so I'm Paula Kennedy, I am a COO and co-founder of a company called Sintasso, and I will ask the panelists to introduce themselves. So, Rachel. Hello, my name is Rachel Wanacott. I'm Associate Director for Container Platform Engineering at Fidelity International. I've spent 10 years being a hands-on software engineer, but I recently moved into leadership, so it's more of an architectural role, and I'm very glad to be here with you. <laughs> Thank you. Suhail? Hi, my name is Suhail, um, and I am a senior staff engineer at Monzo Bank uh, in the UK, um, and I have been, uh, for the last decade, also really hands-on in building reliable systems. Uh, and funnily enough, I never found myself you know, wanting to go work for a bank, uh, but there is more in common <laughs> with you know, building reliable systems and systems at scale at a financial institution than most other uh, institutions um, yeah, across the world. Interesting. Thank you. My name is Jinghong Bainhot. I'm from Saxo Bank. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm leading a few platform engineering teams there. And Saxo Bank is not a traditional bank. We are offering online trading platforms. So if you're thinking about some banks might be uh, slow and process heavy, we are process heavy, but we're definitely not sl slow. And <laughs> I hope <laughs> we can have a chance to dive a little bit into it later. Nice. Hi everyone, I'm Chris Plank. I work for NatWest Bank in the UK. We're one of the top four banks in the UK and serve 20 million customers, so we're not small. And as I reminded earlier on, I'm the old man of the team here. I've been around doing this for 30 years, doing platforms and infrastructure. Okay, great. So I'd like to start with a question that I feel like I get asked often, which is, where to get started with platform engineering. And I specifically want to ask you all how your organization started with platform engineering, kind of what was the trigger that made your organization start thinking about platform engineering? So I don't mind who goes first. I'm a little shy to go first. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, like, like all good initiatives, we had uh, a new senior leader come into the organization who uh, set a 100-day vision and then set some other visions around that really about uh, simplification, going faster, doing things more efficient, right? We've all heard that. I think every organization is trying to do the same thing. Um, and that came at the same time as kind of this new wave of AI it started getting talked about. And we started doing things in the AI space. And you know, if you're a regulated industry, there's a lot of concerns about the patterns and the approaches that we're going to take for AI. None of those existed. You know, we had 135 plus patterns. They'd been around for a long time, they were trusted. There were the ways, uh, you know, the golden paths that people could follow to get things done in the org, get them done quickly. But over time, they were beginning to slow down. We didn't have any of those for AI. So we had to start thinking about how do we do this differently? Because that's kind of unsustainable to keep, you know, creating those patterns, spending a lot of time, money, and effort on those, maintaining those, when things are moving so, so fast. I mean, this community is brilliant, right? We had KubeCon Paris uh, earlier in the year, what was that, April time, and we're back again now. Look at all the things that have changed in that time. All the announcements, 
how do we keep, keep up with those things? So we've got to modernize, we've got to move on from kind of the ways of the past, and that, that was the kickstart, right? A new, okay. a new leader, and just things happening. You know, we started joining this community, started taking part and started doing things. Sure. So I think we started by accident almost, <laughs> and it was before like platform, good all efforts, right? Yeah, before platform engineering had had that term coined. So I'm sure a lot of people here heard of PaaS or platform as a service. So platform was already in the name, and we were using Cloud Foundry on physical tin all the way back in 2012. So we knew that we wanted to standardize, lower the barrier to entry, speed, reduce cost, all of the classic things within a bank. Whether or not we knew at that time that platforms were specifically the goal, we shared the same ethos that I think platform engineering has evolved to be today. And certainly a lot of the learnings that we took from that decade-long journey of doing some things really well, but also missing the mark elsewhere, we brought into our journey with Kubernetes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for, for us, uh, we started very much uh, being very much cloud native, uh, but to, in order to do that, we actually had to beg the regulator uh, because we were part of this new wave of uh, banks, like startup banks, uh, that were allowed by the regulator to, uh, you know, they, they were loosening some of the regulations on their end so that they could have new companies, um, you know, uh, start and, and emerge and, and form and, you know, sort of refine the UK banking system. And we were part of that new wave of, of industry, but we had to literally beg the regulator to please allow us to go and deploy systems on the cloud. Cloud wasn't something that they understood really really well to the point where you got questions like please can you point out on the map where the data centers are uh, because they might want to go visit them um, and fun funnily enough like you know one of the reasons we weren't able to choose a particular cloud provider really big cloud provider is because they weren't uh, you know willing to sign up to a financial exemption clause uh, you know allowing the regulator to go and visit so funnily enough AWS signed that clause where a regulator on demand could go and visit the data center um, so you know we were able to really take advantage of a lot of the a lot of the initiatives that were happening in cloud and it's something that we as engineers were really really familiar with um, you know, in early on when we employed people, we employed people who came with a cloud native background, uh, but weren't very familiar with building a bank rather than the other way around. Uh, so, you know, for us, like building banking systems was quite a novel thing. Uh, you know, of course, we'd all been built accounting systems and billing systems. You know, building ledgers weren't like, you know, new to us, but building them reliably for cloud native architecture was new and novel for a lot of the industry. Um, and for us, you know, building on top of a paved road, a solid platform is an investment that we put in right from the get-go. One of the good things about regulation is regulation uh, and regulators move really, really slowly. So for us, we were able to use that time uh, that they took to give us a banking license to really build a paved road so that once we got the license, uh, you know, we were able to accelerate and put our foot on the gas um, and you know, really have engineers focus on building on top of that paved road rather than building lots of different like, individual pockets of systems and services that look completely different. I've never heard anyone say how great it is that regulations are slow. So sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you need to use it to your as as advantage to you. I think it's for Saxo Bank is a little bit different. We have always have this maybe not core platform. It, it was a term earlier, like just like DevOps was on a term 15, 16 years ago. Um, but we always have the, the idea and the belief to always automate things. So do things in a consistent way because we are highly regulated. So let's say, for example, five, 10 years ago, there was a still a version control system. So for us as platform teams, the only thing we offer to, to uh, developers was standards. So there's always standard way of deploying things, where to store things, where to deploy things, how do you release, how do you track, how do you do auditing. Everything has always been given, might not be the most optimal one, but it was in the consistent consistency, in the predictability. Like you can you can safely assume this is gonna be in the way how you do things in this bank. So we been pretty good at improving it cons constantly. But there's no a uh, pivotal point to say, oh from here we start doing platform engineering, or from here we start doing DevOps. But at all time we have a way but there's, of course, platform teams behind the scene try to strive, try to do, um, for example, go to conferences, learn new things, come home, try it, and they get it approved. Then we educate our developers, and then we try to do the things in a new way. For example, when we moved from DevOps to GitOps, there was a huge challenge for us 
to fulfill, say, how do we do change process now? Because we no longer have a pipeline. When we trigger, we can say, from this point, you deploy your changes there, and who's the one approving, et cetera. So we need to come up a new way, say, actually, at the pull request, that's the time we, we're going to deem that you have deployed your change, even though it hasn't, might not be rolled out immediately. But that's just how us try to innovate with, within the guardrail we have on the, on the compliance that we need to fulfill. Okay. Thank you all. So um, a quote I heard recently was that platform engineers are just ops in a trench coat. So I'm interested to know, with your organizations, like how many platform engineers do you have with that job title? How many platform teams? What, is, what does the actual kind of organization of platform engineering look within your financial organizations? I've maybe uh, got a controversial opinion here, which is um, on, one, one of the things that we actually look for when we hire people is not to look for the platform arc, uh, engineer stereotype, the archetype. Um, we want people who are familiar with building platforms, so we want software engineers that are familiar with building platforms. Ultimately, when, when you're a customer or what have you, you don't care about the intricacies of running the platform. And you know, one of the things that I see is that people come in, I do a lot of like interviewing and speaking with people, they get super hyper invested on the tool. So like, you know, we're here at KubeCon, you know, getting super invested in Kubernetes and Envoy and Jaeger and Prometheus and you know, as if you can cobble all of these technologies together and you know, build a really reliable bank. These are tools, these are utilities, these are really good, really robust utilities, and it's really good that we have all of these industry standards and you know, conferences like these where we can share knowledge and, and things like that. But ultimately, for customers, they are just tools. And you know, as uh, like engineers that work on a platform, our core mission is to abstract away that level of detail. Uh, you know, it's really interesting when I speak to a lot of engineers that work within, like, you know, within parallel teams to, to mine, one of the things that they really love is that the platform teams and uh, the engineers that work in my teams take care of building that reliable platform and we have that shared understanding, uh, you know, that, that shared contract that says, okay, you folks will run these things to reliability and we'll run these things to reliability. Everyone cares about reliability, you can't abstract that away, right? So by definition, everyone might be a platform engineer, uh, you know, within an organization. We, we hire over 300 engineers. Does that mean that we have over 300 platform engineers? Because ultimately, everyone has to care about reliability and security and maintainability and writing good tools. I don't think it's just a core group of people that contribute to that. You know, we run a bit of the platform, but then there are other teams and other organizations that run their slice of the platform. Uh, you know, our abstraction layer is Kubernetes and Envoy and Jaeger and Prometheus and all these things, and their abstraction layers are the systems and services that run on top of these things. But ultimately, we all, as engineers, engineers do a slice of platform engineering. So you're saying we're all platform engineers. I we love are all that. platform engineers. <laughs> Everyone's a platform engineer, really. Chris? So I think it varies based on the size of your organization, right? Uh, I mean, we are a massive organization. There's 62,000 staff worldwide. You know, we've got uh, tens of divisions, hundreds of teams, thousands of developers. You talked about 300 developers. We'll probably put 6,000 on uh, over the next year in India alone. That's, that's been talked about. And We've been hugely successful at enabling the business to go off and do kind of self-managed, self-engineering. We've given them tools like you talked about. We've given them Terraform, standard modules, right? But they've gone off and they've created an opinion around that themselves and they've done their own solutions in their own ways. They've become those engineers. They've become the platform team, not a central team anymore. And over time, we've put more and more load on them. Cognitive load. You know, we've talked a lot this week about is it shift left or is it shift down and all these different terms mm. that people are now trying to coin, right? But really, we've, we've asked developers to stop focusing on the application and the business logic and start looking at infrastructure and platform stuff. And so they end up having to know more and more and more. Maybe we need to get back to simplification, get back to if you're a Java developer, all you want to do is write Java, come in on day one, write some Java, click this in backstage. You get an environment, you get the details of how you deploy your application, and you go and test it. You might even have it in production that day, right? That used to be what everyone talked about. But now we're having conversations about platform and, you know, Kiverno and what's our policy going to be for this? And you're, you're kind of like, should we be bringing some of those things back into central teams? So part of what we're doing is we're trying to take an approach where we, we enable the different platform teams to start contributing to an entire product and we've really got that product-based vision now that, you know, 
the platform team on its own doesn't have to do everything, doesn't have to solve all the problems, other people can start contributing. A bit of an inner source type approach where different teams can actually start doing their little bit, whether that's security, uh, whether that's storage, networking, whatever it is, right? And if we create these reusable building blocks centrally and we put them in an omni-repo type approach, then people can see that, they can observe it, they can look at what's being done. They can start making requests to improve it. You know, if they want another feature that we've not got on our backlog, maybe they can just do that so that we don't have to. So, yeah, everyone becomes like the platform engineer because you just change the model. You, you know, you move away from a central team. You still have central teams, but you enable everyone to contribute. I really, really like your opinion because that's how it, it is actually going on as well at Saxo Bank. I think that when you are a little bit smaller, it's great because you can work much tighter together or you can, you almost everyone knows everyone. But when you grow to certain size, you have to start thinking about abstraction, have to start creating framework. So it makes sense. So it doesn't get too messy, the entire landscape. So for us, when we establish the core team, we also start building framework. And once we have the framework, it was so easy for other team to chip in because now they see how the whole automation flow will be. We basically bring the whole reconciliation, the GitHub principle from Kubernetes for things even running outside of Kubernetes. So we use that to reconcile our dependency both within and outside of Kubernetes. And all other teams can understand that once they see the framework. So it becomes very easy for everyone to contribute if they want to. If they don't, they can still have the very simple API, very simple interface we have created for them. And then they can just be the end user of it. In the same time, have the ability to be a contributor. Me next. Um, so this is an interesting question. I think we get really bogged down in naming things. In software engineering, everyone knows that naming things is really hard, but there is benefit to having a vocabulary so that you can share understanding with someone when you're having a conversation. So I could answer this question in two ways. I could agree with you and say everyone is a platform engineer, but then that would also leave people that are specialists, and I think application developers have a lot of value when they're allowed to be specialists, so that answer doesn't quite suit me. But equally, if we say that no one is a platform engineer, we're missing the customer. So if you've heard me speak at any previous conferences, I often say that platform engineering was the evolution of DevOps. And I don't think they're mutually exclusive. In the same way, I don't think DevOps is mutually exclusive from site reliability engineering or even software engineering at its core. There's lots of overlap. So DevOps often spore out lots of individual teams doing things their own way, which led to duplication, increased in cost, increasing complexity, and people didn't necessarily have the customer in mind. I was a hands-on engineer myself for 10 years. I love writing code. It's so easy to get distracted by this new shiny technology that you want to use and forget that you're solving a problem for the business. And if you work for a financial institution, it very much is a business requirement that you need to consider. So where we've called people platform engineers, it was mostly to remind them that they're building something for standardization and for the customer. But we're still using all of those beautiful principles from DevOps and SRE. So something you mentioned in the question was, are we calling people platform engineers? We have actually recently gone through a restructure, classic, where we've called ourselves Surely enterprise not. engineering, lovely stuff, and we have platform and we have enablement. I talk a lot about team topologies, so probably you can see where we got those names from. And the reason that we've named it, even though naming is hard, is for people that are new to platform engineering to keep the customer at the core. But I would say we've had two original teams, so the original Cloud Foundry team, many of whom still exist in the organization, and later on our AWS and Azure DevOps teams have really been doing platform engineering for a long time. But we've finally given them a label that allows them to identify with one another. And if you think about the psychology, it's easier to relate to someone when you think they're like you. If you've read any scientific papers, we like to stay in groups. We want to be like one another. We relate more to people that look like ourselves. And actually, what we've seen is by calling everyone a platform engineer, they start to see that it's a shared journey and a shared goal. Interesting. OK, thank you for that. Uh, seems like you're all sort of in agreement that everybody's doing a bit of platform engineering somewhere. One of the things I want to maybe dive into where maybe you aren't all going to agree is how to measure the efforts of platform engineering. Right? It feels like it's an interesting topic. Uh, the new DORA report, state of DORA, like the new uh, state of kind of DORA report came out. 
couple of weeks ago, I think. Nathan Harvey spoke about it on Platform Engineering Day on Tuesday. Uh, and it was interesting that he reflected that platform engineering is not necessarily increasing kind of software reliability, which was an interesting statement. And he has some hypotheses as to why. But I'm keen to understand from you all, like, how are you measuring your platform efforts? Are you using Dora metrics? Are you using something else? Rachel's laughing because I'm, I'm notorious for having an opinion, right? I don't care about Dora. There, I said it, right? <laughs> um, Controversial, you heard it here first. Controversial, you know me, Paula, right? Dora is not important for us right now, right? We're using what we're doing in our platform engineering space as a transformation exercise, right? We're transforming our division. We're transforming our organization. We're simplifying things. So the metrics that we are measuring, some of them are actually about people, about the number of people that we're training up every quarter on some of the new practices, the new tooling, the new techniques, the new mindset. You know, there's an awful lot of things that we talk about here and we come here. I'm the only one from the bank here. So I've got to take all this home. I've got to spread that. I've got to be that evangelist that spreads it internally. And I'm sure there's a lot of you in the audience that have got to do exactly the same, right? It costs a lot to come to a conference, especially when you come from Scotland all the way to <laughs> Utah, right? Um, so we're, we're measuring it really in you know, the number of people that we've transformed, the number of products that we come out with. We're really trying to get people, you talked about this, the consistent API, you know, the tool that we're using for that framework, Gratix from Syntasso. We're, we're trying to create these building blocks using that. And we'll count the number of building blocks to be honest, do we care what building blocks some of the teams are creating right now, you know, after they've done the training? No. I actually don't care what they go off and they build. Neither does my senior leader. We want them to get the training. We want them to learn about the new tool. Just as they did seven years ago when they learned about Terraform and the new tool and then, right? It's if you educate them, you train them, you give them the kind of mindset and the space to go and do things, they'll do amazing stuff, right? We've seen that. We've got some fantastic teams They've built some really good products for our customers. And like you say, it's always about the customer, right? So everything's about how we simplify things, make it quicker for our teams to develop an innovative products for our customers. And if we can transform our platform teams, engineering teams, whatever you want to call them, whatever label you want to give them, you know, those things that they create, we'll have that Lego building blocks. You know, when you pull it out for your kids, right, and you can start making different shapes, that's really where we want to be. And I think when we get to that level, that's when we actually see a velocity of uh, products that we create, innovation, you know, so that's what we're going to measure, not a Dora metric. It might come, somebody might look at it and come out with one of PowerPoint or, you know. But, yeah. Okay, I feel like I think it a different opinion, on, right? Yeah, it, it, I think it depends on who you ask in the organization. Some, sure. some in Saxo definitely say, okay, we are measuring, but no. It, in, in, in real life, I would say if, our, if we are doing a bad job, the platform teams, our engineer will let us know. We are sitting so close, and we also have a lot of cross-team initiatives. They, it, it travels so fast, the message, if they are unhappy about certain things. And that's how we keep the feedback loop tight and improve okay. along the way. Um, many of our the, the feature we are supporting, those building blocks that we are creating, they are based on the, 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 the necessity. Say how much impact is this feature gonna do to our developers? What, where's the main pain point? And that's our next. That's our. That's gonna be put on to our roadmap to to work on first. That's how we prioritize. Okay. So therefore, I would say f for us. This is more helping our developer to be a happy developer. Because no, no matter, we can say the business, they want to do a lot of things. But in the end of the day, as us, a trading, online trading platform, everything we do is delivered by our developer. So if they are unhappy, there's no way they will write a good software, can offer a reliable service. So for, for us, the, the way to, to improve, if there's any metrics, it's the happiness of our developer. Nice. Hard to measure, though. <laughs> and I agree with that. Right. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. You, should, you should focus on the happiness of your developers and your engineers and give them the space right, to go and create and innovate. Because we, we've all seen the controls that you sometimes get in banks exactly. where you know, they're, they've got locked down desktops and they're not able to do things, they're not able to innovate. And there's nothing worse than a frustrated developer, right? Because eventually they'll just move on. Okay. And so it sounds like you two are in agreement that develop happiness is the main metric. What do you think, Zahel? 
I'm really disappointed because I wanted this to be the controversial bit of the <laughs> of the panel, uh, but I'm, I'm more going to say that I, I, I'm also in, in agreement. The thing with Dora is that um, Dora is something that the regulators now understand, right? Uh, so it's actually a really, really good measure to like you know expose to them and say, okay, well, actually, all these initiatives we do internally with our engineers and things like that, you know, the regulator ultimately doesn't care, but they do care about the intersection between like reliability and security and things like that, and Dora metrics are a fantastic proxy because as an industry like you know you look at uh, a lot of the people that they speak to in industry boards and you know a lot of the bigger companies and smaller companies that are part of a lot of these forums dora seems to be the consistent metric that everyone seems to be measuring so it's something that we measure as well but it's not the thing that we drive change from if that makes sense uh, you know we do a lot of surveying of engineers um, we use a tool called dx uh, which is really really good which sends out surveys to engineers and then from there we capture dora metrics uh, so you know obviously we measure like you know, time to recovery and you know, time to like change deploy and, and things like that uh, for all of our software deployments and things like that. Um, and you know, typically this granularity is in minutes, right? Uh, because we want it to be in minutes. So you know, we are far above the industry benchmark and things like that to the point where measuring the metric becomes meaningless because you know, in in comparison to the the, the industry benchmark, we are leagues ahead. Uh, but it does serve as a really really good proxy for engineers themselves, right? Are engineers satisfied? Um, you know, we don't have the luxury of having a really big engineering force. Uh, so for us, you know, make sure that engineers are able to deploy and able to use their time because engineer downtimes are ultimately really costly for us as an organization. Um, and you know, we have just reached profitability and things like that. So this is something that we have to be really really concerned concerned about, you know, if we need to add another 100 engineers, uh, you know, that is adding another one third of capacity that we have, right, across an organization. And, you know, engineers don't come cheap. Um, so, like, you know, and, and time and energy and also the complexity uh, of your organization grows. You know, something that you mentioned is in a small organization, everyone knows everyone, right? So you know exactly what you're working on. You know you have that shared understanding. As that organization grows, uh, you know, you need to have a lot of structure to make sure that all plans are synchronized and things like that. How do you make sure that you spread like you know, reliability as a metric and security as a metric? Uh, Dora is a really, really good thing to measure to say, okay, right, there's this particular area, even though like, you know, it is like its own pocket uh, that is having a, a big uh, you know, area of unreliability. Like you know, maybe the error budget has been breached far too many times, right? How do you make sure that you have leaders that are aware, okay, right, this is bringing down the rest of the organization um, and they need to you know, shift their priorities in order to tackle some of this thing rather than ship product at like, you know, 100 miles an hour. Yeah. I've loved watching your presentations over the last five years or so, maybe a bit more than that, you know, and the evolution of Monzo, because you started at Greenfield, right? You, you, it was nice and simple and clean, and you've been able to come up with these processes, and it's all about the developer. You haven't had the complexity that some of the other banks have got, and you, you, know, you mentioned that earlier. I mean, I do this a lot, right? So hands up anyone who's running Kubernetes on the mainframe. I want to talk to you after. <laughs> right, and that's typically the answer. There's maybe one, if I'm lucky, in the audience, right? And so the bigger the bank that you are, the longer established you are, the more complex the things are. And metrics like Dora don't often apply to some of those platform teams. You know, because some of these things, like the mainframe, could have been stable for ages. And you're introducing new technologies, like, you know, putting OpenShift on Z series or ZCX. Um, to try and modernize some of the things that those people are doing, not, not really for just mod modification, uh, modernization's sake, but these things have run stably for decades. The staff are retiring. You've got to get new blood in, and the new blood's got these different metrics and different ways of working, right? So, yeah, Dora, for your type of organization, I totally understand it, but when you've got lots of different platform teams, lots of different complexity and technologies, Maybe it's not the right metric. And I, I, I mean, I'm part of the, the uh, Tag App Delivery Platform Working Group, take part in that quite a bit. And I, I actually like the platform maturity model and using that and some of the techniques in there to start thinking about, you know, what's right for your teams? Well, where should you be in that model? What should your funding cycle type approach be? So there's, there's lots of stuff out there that you can apply. It doesn't necessarily have to be Dora. What about at Fidelity, Rachel? How are you kind of measuring platform success? I'm going to address the controversy there about Dora, and it's nice to joke and say that we don't care, but I think it would be naive if you work in an industry like we do to ignore it, or to, simply because you don't agree with the wording of it, not to take it seriously. 
the hard truth is if you're a senior leader at a financial institution, you will have to answer to Dora and to the regulators on those topics. So much better to understand where they're coming from and try and educate them if you feel that they've missed the mark. So with any policy, it quite often lags behind. You can't expect someone that's not in the weeds, so in this case, the weeds to be writing the code and deploying Kubernetes to fully understand the metrics that will bring the most value. And you've also got different layers of a, of a viewpoint. So developer happiness, absolutely, but that doesn't necessarily bring profit to the business, which is still really important. So you need to scale from is the developer happy all the way through to is Fidelity International making more money than it is last year? Because ultimately that's why we want to move quicker. There's also things like reliability and security. I'm on call, right? I'm on escalation 24 seven. I'd love to go to bed knowing that nothing's gonna go wrong. So obviously those metrics are really important to me, but again, it doesn't guarantee profit. So a senior leader or someone that's technical but isn't hands-on needs to bridge that gap between what the engineers care about with what the business cares about. And both is equally valid. If the business is not making money, we don't need engineers, and we are solving a software engineering problem within the confines of a regulated industry. So you have to take Dora seriously. So I think my response to this would be, figure out where you think the gaps are, articulate to the big four where you think the gaps are, and evidence how you're addressing it. So if you don't think that time to market is the right measure, tell them what is, and show them the code. And using a platform is a really nice way to evidence what the expected behavior of every workload is. So we've introduced standardization by baking in reliability and security with the same config for every namespace, so you know what the expected behavior is. It reduces the amount of configuration you need to provide as evidence to the auditors, so you can focus the conversation on that gap. Um, as humans, we don't necessarily resonate with people that come from a different place than us. That's similar to the answer I gave earlier about people that look like us. As an engineer, I really hated audits. Waste of my time, long meetings, it's boring. But actually, as someone that's moved through being a technical lead to then being a senior leader, I've come to understand that there are actually people that have come to work, and they also have a goal to achieve. And if you just talk to them and understand where they're coming from, it becomes a lot easier to address. So we all need to make friends with auditors. Is that Maybe not saying? friends, but you can be nice. <laughs> they can be friends. <laughs> okay, we have just a few minutes left. So uh, for folks in the audience, if you've got any questions for the panel, then there are microphones, I think, uh, sort of at the back, so you can stand near a microphone and I'll come to you and ask you a quick question. Um, I wanted to ask just one more from my list, sorry, which was, you've all mentioned about the financial regulations, the auditors, the, you know, the, the people that you've got to kind of appease to get licenses to be able to trade in this industry. What's been the kind of the biggest blocker or the biggest challenge that you've faced in that kind of environment? Is it, is it harder to do platform engineering in a regulated environment or is it not actually that hard and regulation gets used as an excuse for not being able to get stuff done? I think uh, for, for us specifically, teaching the regulator, um, and I wouldn't class this as a hard problem, I class it as a really, really interesting problem, but they're sort of working with the regulator to understand what they are trying to achieve. So for example, in the UK, um, one of the things that has recently been introduced is like a key supplier risk. There's this regulation, SS121, SS221, very boring. You can uh, very you know, uh, notebook uh, LM this, uh, this regulation. It's, it's really well written. Uh, it's really, really well written. Um, but it's really interesting because um, actually, um, who here in the audience uh, you know, is, runs a data center? like their own data center, works in an organization that runs their own data center. Okay, keep your hand up if you think that that data center is more reliable than what AWS runs. Every single person has put their hand out apart from that one individual over there, brave, and that one individual over there who's also brave. Um, and it's really, really interesting because this is something that we are contending with the regulator with, right? You know, they firmly believe that, you know, going multi-region in AWS is less reliable than uh, running two data centers that are 20 miles apart where an organization literally flips a big lever to say, okay, we've done a, we've done a failover process and half the things broke, but I pinky promise we will fix them, right? And this is what, this is the landscape that we are contending with because there's an area that is well understood, there's a practice that is well understood, and there's an area within platform engineering, cloud, like all of these things which, you know, feel like really, like, you know, unnovel to us in probably this audience today, but it's still really, really novel to regulators and the rest of the industry, right, who may have actually not had the hands-on experience. I think this is the bit that is lacking, is that, you know, a lot of people in these regulatory bodies, they have been part of maybe that transformation just as they were getting into, like, you know, 
uh, DevOps or, or like operations, things like that, but they've not had the hands-on experience of running systems reliably on cloud infrastructure, on Kubernetes and things like that. So a lot of the questions that get asked, uh, you know, they may seem quite naive and quite basic, um, but they actually come from a really, really good place because they care about the same metrics that we care about, but maybe from a slightly different angle. But trying to tease that out of them, you know, if you see this relationship with the regulator to be a combative relationship, then it's never going to work in your favor. But actually working with the regulator say, okay, like, what are you trying to achieve? Because we can evidence what we believe uh, like, you know, you'd like to see to showcase uh, the same underlying truth, which is these systems are reliable, these systems are secure, these systems are working as intended, but in our own way rather than in the way that you're expecting. So you know, where a regulator might expect you know, five forms of QA to be done uh, with manual testing and a full tick sheet of every single thing. Like, you know, how do we say, okay, right, that has been fully automated, right? And here is the code to showcase that that has been automated and the computer cannot be forward and we use these platforms to do so, right? Reconciling the two is like a constant uh, thing that we are doing with the regulator. And I think that helps level up the rest of the industry as well. Nice. So I was lucky in a previous uh, role, previous company, to be part of one of the regulator forums that they held. It was really interesting. It was, a, it was sponsored by one of the CSPs, but it had regulators from around the world. And the differences of opinion that they all had was staggering. None of them agreed on the same type of approach. And, and I think that's where you know, none of them are prescriptive at the moment. Um, some of them will have some guidelines and some things that will come out uh, that they've, they've managed to you know, uh, document that. But I think it is really difficult for them right, to actually understand the complexity of AWS or you know, GCP or anything else, you know, because for so long they've been regulating against data centers and this new stuff's coming along. Now there's some fantastic teams that are helping in the CSPs uh, to do that and to have those conversations and try and have them with the regulator direct so that you're not ha you know, each company is not having to repeat uh, the same thing. And if you can tap into those teams in the CSPs, it certainly makes your life a lot easier because then they're aware of all the conversations, you're kind of all having them together. But there is a concern about you know, consolidation, having an awful lot of people on the same CSPs in the same regions. And so there's, there's still a lot happening in that space. That's why they prefer the two data centers, right? OK, thank you both. I'm going to open it up to an audience question, if that's OK. Go ahead. Yep. Hello, I can uh, sympathize with Chris. I feel like the old man in the room We're going from mainframes to distributed systems and now we're cloud adjacent to cloud native. So seeing that progression, you see some fatigue in organizations as they start going through that. It's almost like a whip, whiplash back and forth. I can understand what Sahil's talking about because coming from different regulatory uh, frameworks in like, you know, uh, high frequency trading or exchanges, you know, banking, it's like certain regulatory bodies don't even, like, they're not even at parity. So you'll talk to one regulator and like, you know, FINRA, they're so much more progressive than another and that's just way in the, in the back. So it almost feels like there's a Cassandra complex having come from so many different environments and, ha you know, having to do architecture now and see, I see where the bodies are going, I see where the, the regulation is going to be, but I think you guys nailed it also you want to make sure developers are happy, and obviously regulations don't accelerate developers very well. And so how do you, how do you balance the, that Cassandra complex? I know the train's coming, it's gonna hit us, and we're gonna get smacked as hard as possible, but if we implement this now, we're gonna have a bunch of angry developers because they can't develop anywhere near as fast with the velocity that they're currently used to. Okay. Right, so our approach with those building blocks is really to have those as building blocks, right? Um, you know, we, we used to talk about guide rails when we were trying to like guide people that were writing some Terraform to do things in public cloud. Now if we start thinking about a product oriented type approach, we're baking all that stuff into the product, right? And we're making those products available for them to go and build upon. So you, you've kind of separated it out, you've baked all the, and through the contribution model, right? You've baked all of that stuff into the product and you've enabled them to go off and build on top of that platform. And I think the more of that we can do and the more we can get people contributing to that, then you, you've got kind of consistency of approach, standardization, right? We used to all write standard stocks before we federated a lot of this stuff back out. And instead of writing dusty documents now, really we can put that in Git, you know, so people can read it, it's in the code, you can see it via uh, just looking at GitLab or, or Backstage. Um, but it's in the product. And if there's something that changes, then people can fork that, they can make a change to it. They can, uh, you know, contribute and submit that. So I think that's the direction we seem to be heading in. There's a lot more of that 
just bake it into the products and make it simpler for everyone. And then because that's kind of in an omni repo, it's observable. You know, not, not in the metrics sense, but someone can look at it, they can touch it, they can see what it actually is. And you start changing your org by doing that. Anyone else got any comments on balancing regulation and developer happiness? I think for us, usually it is you need to be able to sort of protect your developers in a way that you need to translate the regulation into actionable items and put it into backlog. Because if you just throw some strategy of this big fluffy word, say we need to be this and that compliant, developers they will just be, okay, how do I do this? I don't know where to start. But if you tell them, say, hey, you need to make this server more resilient, or need to improve that incident recovery time, they know how to do that because that's, that's actionable. So I think you just need to find the right level of communication. Okay. I think we also. Uh, we might have time for one more quick question. Okay. Um, so there's a stereotype about regulated industries that the pace of innovation is kind of slow. That could be true or not true, but do you have a hard time attracting skilled engineers? Sorry, can you repeat that last part? Do you have a hard time attracting skilled developers or skilled engineers? I think yeah. I might take this one if you will, Chris. Um, so hiring is a huge challenge. I think particularly if you're a financial and you're not known necessarily for being a, techno like a technology company, people want to work for the Googles and the Facebooks, but actually we've got a lot of money, so we have some great tools. We're building some really fun things. So one of the biggest reasons I come to conferences is to talk about the exciting things that we're doing so that those really skilled people want to come and work with us. Some of the most intelligent people I've ever worked with work at Fidelity in our organization. And I come from an astrophysics background, so I've met some pretty smart people. And often they say, wow, I didn't realize that you were doing this or that you had access to the technology. So what we're trying to do is be more visible. So anyone here that's working at an organization that maybe struggles, get yourself to a conference, put yourself on stage, maybe feel a little bit uncomfortable. And actually, regulation is just a software engineering problem. It's still really exciting to solve. Nice. I'm going to echo everything that Rebecca said. Like, you know, uh, there is like just so much innovation going on within our space, and regulators aren't there to slow things down. Yeah, they're there to put in standardized guardrails, uh, which is absolutely okay. Uh, and these are all guardrails that, like, you know, that all of the industry works with. Um, but you know we market ourselves as a, as a tech company. And when you come and join, for example, uh, if you come and join Monzo, or actually many of the companies here on this stage, uh, you know, you'll know you find that you're much more focused on building the actual technology that you forget that you work for a financial institution. Um, you know, There's a lot of nodding here. You forget that you work at a financial institution because we've got our abstractions so right that the guardrails are in the right place, uh, like, you know, that the actual regulation doesn't proliferate. You don't wake up every day and be like, oh, right, how am I going to comply with this laundry list of regulations, right? Like, you know, those things are standardized and we've got a lot of people working on those, like from a risk perspective and things like that. And like, you know, automating a lot of that away. Um, so the companies that lag behind where, you know, you, you're going in day by day and being slowed down are the ones that haven't invested in that automation. And I think one of the reasons that we're all here on stage is because we have invested in that automation. Uh, and we, you know, I think collectively as a, as, a, as a group are saying, if you invest in this automation, you can hire a really high caliber engineers and you can innovate at pace um, for, for across all of our organizations. Okay, I think we are pretty much out of time slash over time. So a uh, big round of applause to our panelists.